I was starting to feel, and I think many of us are starting to worry, that the planet has been utterly ruined by us as a species, as a creature, and definitely we have transformed planet Earth and destroyed much of it, but there are still incredible wilderness areas out there that I think we need to know about, we need to learn about, we need to understand, we need to protect, and we need to fight for as well if we're gonna have any hope of combating climate change and protecting biodiversity. We went to four astonishing wilderness areas of the planet, areas where the impact of humanity was low, not non-existent because there is nowhere that is untouched by us as a species. Obviously there's plastic particles at the bottom of the ocean and the top of the highest mountains, but we went to areas where human impact was low, where nature is still largely in charge. So we went to the Congo rainforest, we went to Patagonia, to the high Andes, to somewhere called the South Patagonian ice field, went to the Coral Triangle, which is an area of, uh, incredible area of ocean and sea around mainly the Philippines and Indonesia. And we went to the Kalahari in Southern Africa. And it was a series of pretty incredible expeditions. In this series, you, you interact with indigenous communities who have been sort of sustainably managing the lands um, and the, the remote areas that you visit. Yeah. Um, what did you learn from them? Um, Goodness, yeah, so much. Um, how to sum it up? I think one of the, one way is, uh, what one of my guides, Adams Kasinga in the Congo um, said to me at one point, he says, he said that the community we were with, who was the, who were the backer, in a remote area of the um, Congo Basin. He said, they take what they need from mother nature, not what they want. So their footprint is so much smaller than ours, but their, their relationship with mother nature around them is very different. They don't look to dominate, they don't look to destroy, they look to live in a much more sustainable, holistic way that can last for generation after generation. So I, I think I learned about a little bit more about how to leave a lighter footprint, how to respect nature around you. I think I learned more also not just how indigenous people have lived in wild places, but they have shaped them as well. I mean, we saw it ourselves when we were with some of the Baka in the Congo and we were a long way from their camp. They wanted some food, they had dug up some wild yams and then they planted very carefully the stems back in the ground afterwards so they could know that there would be food there for them to eat in the future. But we know, we know that indigenous people around the planet have practiced a form of gardening essentially over the centuries. We know there are concentrations of fruit trees in the Amazon, for example, that can only be explained by people planting them. Humans have always lived in and shaped these areas and we didn't want to film wilderness areas without not respecting and reflecting the fact that people are there and they're not just existing there, but they've protected those places and cared for them. So there's a moment in the uh, first episode of, of the series where you're in the you're in the Congo rainforest mm. um, and you drive alongside um, some potentially illegal logging you don't know at the time. Mm. Um, I, that's a very very dangerous situation to be in. Um, how how do you navigate that? How how present was the sense of danger in that moment? No, there in that moment I totally under, agree with what you're saying. That the, People asking questions and taking cameras into those sort of situations can be risky, but there wasn't a there wasn't a sense of malice or 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 um, uh, danger there. I have been in similar situations where there has been, and where we've had armed guards with us. Uh, we've I've been on raids in the Amazon to find illegal gold mines where there is that sense anything could happen at any moment. Um, the person facing the most danger was Adams, my guide there, who lives and breathes that every day. I and mean, I think if you watch this program, the great privilege you're getting in a way is Adams's time because he is giving up his time from what he does to try and tell you about the Congo and why, because it matters. He runs an organization which works undercover to tackle and take down gangs of poachers, illegal wildlife traffickers, illegal loggers as well. That is his bread and butter. He does that all the time. So 
in that situation, I'm looking to him as the expert for whether we should be concerned. And he just wanted us to get the numbers so he could find out that were written on the trunks to find out whether it was um, uh, legal logging. But as he said, that doesn't still make it moral. Was there anything that you learned while making the series that was particularly shocking or, or alternatively that gave you, gave you hope for the future of preserving these spaces? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with both of those. Don't remind me about the shocking. Uh, no, I'll go with the shocking first and then the hope. So I think one thing that I found surprising and yeah, and very and shocking um, in, was in the Congo, where I kept meeting people, and we see a couple of the examples in the program where people talked about how they'd been, invo been involved in poaching so they could earn enough money to go to college or, so, college or school. And you know, I've met people before, of course, around the world who are poaching to provide for their families, who are desperate there um, on the poverty line. But these, the people we were meeting, they had a thirst for knowledge. They had no opportunity and they were creating it themselves. But by, by poaching, one of our guides, he'd started out as an elephant poacher, for goodness sake. He'd gone to university, he'd learnt more about the value of the wildlife around him and he'd become a very passionate, committed Congolese conservationist. That was amazing to learn about and understand, but I think it should leave anyone who watches, I hope, thinking, my goodness, I've been very lucky growing up where I have to have an education system on tap for me. That means I don't have to go and hunt precious, precarious wildlife to, to get it. We, there are people out there on this planet who don't have our luck and opportunities, but given a thimble of it, they would, they would, they would have such a different life. So I never forget that, and I found that, I found that really upsetting and shocking, and a reminder to me of my own good fortune. In terms of what made me feel very positive was meeting local conservationists in these wild areas who are some of the most passionate committed, brave um, protectors of wildlife and ecosystems that I've met anywhere in the world. And whereas I think in the past, we might have struggled to find local conservationists and we would have been, we would have found that we've got European conservationists who are working there. It's much easier now um, to find locals who have taken that on themselves. They totally believe in it and they've got real skin in the game. So they are, they're risking their lives in some situations to protect landscapes, ecosystems and wildlife. And they inspire me, their bravery and their passion. So of the uh, four wildernesses that you ended yeah. up uh, visiting for the series, was there one in particular that you felt particularly uh, attached to? Say? I couldn't put a piece of paper between them for the effect they'll have on me in, in terms of my life. I mean, I remember all of them. They were, I, honest to God, each of them was amazing. But if you twist my arm, <laughs> I think the mountains of Patagonia um, had, I know that they had a real impact on me. I suppose the mountains, mountains generally. Um, I'm a mountain person. I was born, I was born in the wrong place, really. I love my mountains. And there was definitely a moment uh, we were trekking up to somewhere called the South Patagonian Ice Field which is a critical mass of frozen water stored up there high in the Andes. It helps regulate the temperature as every large um, element of our ecosystem does, the wider climate and temperature of South America and the tropics. Um, and we were trekking up to that. And we were up in the, high in the mountains, camping out there before we began our final ascent up to the ice sheet. And uh, I was up before, we were all up before dawn and I need to go to the loo. So I went away from where everyone else was um, in their little tents and it was dark. The wind was howling in a way that you've never experienced unless you've been on the surface of Mars or you've clung to the side of a cliff in a storm. I mean, it was powerful and intense, but the moon was out and the mountain range, I came around a little rock corner and the mountain range of the Andes was just there in front of me in the moonlight. It was a staggering moment in experience. And I'm standing there holding my little roll of biodegradable toilet paper <laughs> and taking it all in. I won't forget it. Well, I really enjoyed watching the first episode of the series. Thank you very, very I much. I look forward to the rest. But 
Are there any other wildernesses you'd like to visit soon, for, perhaps for another series? I'd like, yeah, twist people's arms, please, if you can. <laughs> and yes, of course, we've got others that we could um, be talking about. And some of them aren't as far from us as we might think. I went on a little family holiday the year before last, not that long, fresh in the memory. We went on a train to Romania. We climbed up high into the Carpathian Mountains to a very wild part of Europe. And we saw bears and bear cubs every day from a couple of remote hides. That's an extraordinary thing to do. And it is a bit of a reminder. It does still exist out there. It's definitely not as wild as our ancestors would have known, but it's probably a lot wilder if we're not careful than our descendants will know. So we need to know about these areas and protect them. So with <coughs> travel programmes like yours, there's, there's sometimes a concern that increased interest in these yeah. areas um, could lead to sort of over interest with people um, mobbing particularly beautiful spaces. Um, what would you say to people who think that we shouldn't perhaps go and film in these areas and, and show them in, in these sort of big BBC programmes um, because it, it could encourage that kind of over interest in the area? It's a big issue and aspect and we do think about it and and mull it, we really do. Um, there's not going to be mass tourism in the Congo, but does it encourage generally that idea that the world is always ripe for people to get on a plane and get out there and, and visit? Um, yes, there's definitely a risk of that. I am totally aware and conscious of the damage that travel and tourism absolutely can do. And I'm very aware and I've heard and we've incorporated into all my programs from the beginning the catastrophe that we are inflicting on the natural world with climate change and biodiversity loss. I genuinely believe that in the sort of places I'm filming in this series that potentially as, if it can be done as, re, as responsibly and as sustainably as possible, that actually travel and tourism has got a bit of a role to play in protecting these places. Because people think, oh, well, if we don't talk about them, people won't go there. No, no, no. The, there are mining companies, logging firms. There are ranchers who are constantly eyeing up these places with a view to deforesting, stripping, digging, drilling into them. So it's not that they're gonna be left pristine at all, no way. And there are people living in these places who need to put food on their table. I think, and I know, to be honest, that if it's run properly, travel can offer a, an economic incentive to people who live in these areas to protect what most of us desperately want to preserve. I totally acknowledge there is still huge issues with travel, but I'm worried now about us losing the elements of our ecosystem that we need for the planet to survive. So, oh my goodness, we need definitely responsible, sustainable travel and tourism. We definitely don't want um, vast concreted resorts across the center of these wild areas, but that is, that is not genuinely not gonna happen. But I do hope that in some areas at the edges, responsible tourism can give people who live there a reason not to poach wildlife and a reason to protect it. And I've heard that time and time again on my journeys. People who are guides used to be a poacher or they used to dynamite mine, dynamite fish on coral reef. And now they're given a reason to look after those places. So I know it can be a good thing, but I totally respect as well and recognize that industrially it can be a disaster. So what ideally would you like viewers to take away from the series? Oh goodness. I'd just like them, to, I'd like them to be interested. I'd like it to spark a little bit more awareness about wild areas of the planet out there. Perhaps arrogantly, I think um, we've got a role to play in making people more aware um, of what is out there in the world. I think it's important people care about that. I totally respect somebody who disagrees with that or thinks I'm the wrong person to be doing it. I often wonder myself, but I think there is a massive value in um, us learning more about the planet we live on in whatever form. Um, but yes, you've totally got to um, balance how much you glossify a place with um, providing adequate context and showing more of a reality as well. I mean, I slightly 
very pretentiously call it light and shade really in the programs. We put both into the programs I make and sometimes it can feel a bit jarring in some ways, but it's the reality of life out there in whatever form. There is poverty next to incredible wealth. There is um, deforestation next to biodiversity. And I think showing that exists gives people an understanding of the world they're on and it gives them a bit of a sense of the context and it helps them to identify what issues need challenging and what areas need protecting. So I imagine when uh, people view the series, they will uh, be quite keen to, to help preserve these, these wildernesses and, and some wild spaces perhaps closer to home. Mm. Um, what gives you hope for wildernesses in the UK, sort of the remaining wild areas that we have? Um, is, there, is there anything that viewers can do um, after watching your programme to help preserve those spaces? So much, of course. Um, you can be affected and respond to that. You can be upset and respond to that. Um, you can be angry and respond to that. Anger is a motivator. And I think perhaps we don't have enough of that now. We are losing wild places and wild spaces and we need to um, agitate and, and be upset about that and perhaps angry as well. And that can lead to people taking action writing, voting, campaigning, whatever it takes. You, you want your kids, surely, and your grandchildren to live on an interesting planet, on an interesting island off the northwest coast of Europe. So let's try and improve the situation we've got, not make it, not make it worse. Well, Simon, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you for your interest. And it's, I'm delighted and privileged that we've had our chat.